Dr. Nicole, thanks so much for taking the time to have this conversation. Uh, I can tell you that a lot of our crew here was excited about it. They know about uh, who you are and the kind of work you do, and they're excited to hear from you. Well, it's great to be here today, Patrick. Thank you so much for having me. Great. So let's let's get into your background a little bit. So you have a PhD. What, what did you study? What was your academic background? Uh, well, my master's is in biology, as is my undergrad, and I did a lot of carnivore research and lion research over in Botswana, as well as a lot of marine biology. And then I switched and I got my doctorate in sustainability education, but my focus was cultural anthropology. And all of my field work was working with a couple of San Bushman communities over in the Western Kalahari Desert of Botswana. Wow. Okay. So now it's start, you know, the, I'm, I'm starting to see how things emerge for you. So, uh, so, <laughs> got, yeah. so you got out of, you know, you, you completed your academic education and what was, what was the next step in your life? What happened after that? So I did a lot of work. I used to love to travel. I had a Volkswagen van and I spent a lot of time traveling and staying in it and living out of it and uh, really just loved camping and seeing the world. So I do a lot of seasonal work, um, mostly related around some sort of research biology. But finally, in the mid 90s, I decided to join the US Peace Corps and they sent me to the Okavango Delta in Botswana, which is just an outstandingly beautiful place, kind of the best density of wildlife really that you can get almost anywhere. And so I did the US Peace Corps there and after that stint ended, I just loved it so much that I stayed and joined a lion research project and was there living in the bush in the middle of nowhere, kind of prepped me for alone because I, one time I was seven weeks there by myself once and uh, you know, living amongst lions with the time we didn't have you know, things like radios or you know, we didn't have obviously electricity or a lot of the modern things that you have now that tie you into the, the modern world, satellite phones and things like that, we didn't have access to. So often I was by myself, you know, changing tires next to lions with elephants around and black mamba in my, you know, rigged up shower that the elephants used to come and dig up all the time. So <laughs> it was our only, our only thing. We had water. You know, we had to heat the donkey boiler to get with a fire to get water, but we had water. But the elephants would uh, rip that up pretty much the entire dry season. So that's what originally got me there. So when you went and did alone, it wasn't your first rodeo. You, you, you got some experience kind of surviving in uh, minimalistic uh, circumstances. Uh, there's got to be at least one, one or two great stories about, uh, you know, you started to allude to some of them, you know, like having a, did you say a black mamba in the shower? Yes. <laughs> so weird things in my tent. The baboons used to come in my tent and uh, they used to unzip it and go through all my things. They, for some reason, uh, targeted me. Yeah, it was pretty funny. So, and you can't can't show your teeth because it's a shine, sign of aggression. So you have to talk like this you know, when you're trying to yell at the baboons. And <laughs> but yeah, leopards in camp and buffalo in camp and hyenas at night. And oh, it was it was wonderful living in the in the bush in Botswana. It there's nothing quite like it. So I really learned this what I often people call the soft skills over in Africa. And really, I think those are the most important because they're the basic skills everyone should know animal communication, that sort of sixth sense, intuition, bird language, because the birds will tell you everything that's going on in the forest. They know where every predator is. And if you can tune into what the birds are saying, you can avoid predators, or if you're on safari or whatever, and you want to find them, you can find them. But they'll tell you when a snake is in camp also, which is extremely important there. And then of course, tracking, which is an amazing skill to have. And then later on with time that I spent with the Kalahari Bushmen, I started honing those skills, but also learning what people call the hard skills, tanning an animal hide, you know, starting a fire from friction, those sorts of things. And then when I came back to the States, I sort of started to hone those skills even more in my native environment here. So it's, uh, it was quite a journey. So let's talk about, you got back to the States and kind of where, where did it lead you? Because now you came back, I mean, it's like an alternate reality you were living in for some period of time. And, and interestingly, you know, because we want to really have a conversation around survival and survival skills. So you went from that, you know, learning soft and hard skills as you described them, now coming back to where, well, everything's just kind of provided and easy. What was that like for you? And then how did you end up like kind of rolling forward into doing the things you're doing now? It was kind of a hard transition coming back initially. Uh, I moved to Oregon. I knew I wanted to be in the Pacific Northwest, and I'd lived in Alaska previously. I'd worked on the crab boats up there, and I'd done research on the Exxon oil spill years ago. So I wanted to live somewhere wild. So those were my choices. And uh, my best friend at the time lived in Oregon, so that's where I moved to. 
and it was a great choice. I'm still in, live in the Pacific Northwest and I live on property and I love it here because there's just so much land and not that many people because it does rain a lot here. So it <laughs> definitely keeps folks away. And uh, it's a great place to hone skills. And really, you know, if you can build a friction fire in the pouring rain here in Pacific Northwest, you can really do it anywhere. So when I came back, I started working uh, with uh, teaching at traditional skills gatherings, which was a great place because when you teach things, of course, you learn them even more because people always ask really interesting questions that right. makes you sort of deep dive into things. And so I started transferring the skills that I knew really well in the Kalahari Desert back here to the Pacific Northwest and really skills, skills can now be used sort of around the world. And I've been able to practice them in many locations. So here's what's interesting, you know, as we we're doing this end game series, um, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, um, you know, there were survival skills, uh, survivalists, uh, you know, people who were maybe trying to go off grid a bit uh, and, and you know, homesteading. And these were sort of like more fringy type of things, you know, that had that kind of like its, its own small community. And now, I think in part because of you know the, the craziness in the world, I think people are starting to you know get really serious around these skills. So you you've sort of seen it go from uh, how can I put it uh, something that was like a small pocket of people that would have a special interest to you know major TV show that you're on you know that people watch. Uh, we'll talk maybe a little bit more about that. And then also it's it's a kind of a mainstream thing now. So are you finding yourself suddenly very, very busy with people wanting to learn more from you and, and doing more of this type of a, of a, of a thing? Or what, how has your life changed the last few years based on your particular skill set? That's such a great question. You know, I've really seen a shift become from that sort of, sort of survival skills or as I like to call them wilderness living skills because I like to think of them as a long-term solution. And if you think of it as that, it's it's a different mindset. And I feel like it's easier if you think of it in a long as a long-term sort of lifestyle versus something that's just straight up survival. But all those right. skills cross over. Uh, and I really have seen a shift, you know, especially since COVID. I've found that people all of a sudden are looking at their food sources. They are more into prepping. Um, I'm, I'm a prepper. <laughs> I think prepping is great because why not be prepared? It makes all the sense in the world. You don't want to get caught out. And I've also found a huge shift, not only in people learning, wanting to learn survival skills, but also wanting to make sure that they learn about wild foods and wild medicine. Because yes. when you have a shift like we've just had, all of a sudden, you know, there was, we didn't have access to physicians like we needed before. Uh, we didn't have access to physicians like we used to have. We, all of a sudden, people were shifting to wild medicine because it works. And I'm an herbalist and I have an apothecary and put out a lot of information on my website about herbal medicine and why it works. And I really, I'm a scientist. So I'm not just talking anecdotal things. I like to do deep dives into peer reviewed research and present that to people. And there's so much of it out there, but of course, Big Pharma doesn't want us to want everyone to hear it all. So I really feel like one of my goals is to get wild food and wild medicine information out to people so that they can be prepared um, for the next thing or even just the present moment. Because not only does it work, it works without side effects, negative side effects, and also things last a long time. So you can have it just at your fingertips. Oh, and it's free. <laughs> that's always really nice too. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess that's the punchline, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it's free, uh, you know, but, but the knowledge, you know, requires an investment of your time, right? To go and, and learn, you know, how to navigate all this. And that, that's where the effort lies. I guess the terrain is, as far as where you are, in other words, as you said, you're in the Pacific Northwest. Somebody might be in, you know, high desert in Arizona. Somebody might be in South Florida. Uh, maybe they're in the, the woods in, you know, upstate New York. Uh, so how varied are the considerations based on where you happen to be? There are a lot of commonalities. So I find, especially if you live in temperate regions, which is where a lot of the population lives around the world, right? Especially people who are going to be watching this. Uh, for example, when I went to Mongolia for the alone season, the, second season that I went on alone. I knew all the plants, you know, maybe they were slightly different species. Just from what I knew here, I could translate that over there pretty easily to the point where we actually had an indigenous guide showing us a lot of the plants um, 
and a lot of them that I, I was pointing out to him, he actually, they'd lost that information. So it was nice. I could actually give them that information back of some things that were edible and medicinal and uh, really sort of, and he said, we, and he just said, we've lost a lot of the culture. So we've actually lost a lot of that knowledge. So I was pointing out things to him. He was pointing out things to all of us. Uh, it was really fun back and forth. But I find that wherever I go in the world, again, especially in that those temperate regions where most of the that most of us live, uh, that knowledge translates very easily. Especially if you pick things that are really important. Um, we can get into details in herbs if you want to, but let's just use an example of yarrow. It's a great antibacterial. Uh, I've used it a lot on shows. I cut my knuckle off on day 42 or 43 of alone on season two, completely off when I mean, you could see the bone and yarrow cured it. I had already picked some and I was able to make a yarrow bath, put my finger in that. I stopped the bleeding really quickly. It brings fevers down. It's an amazing, amazing plant and you find it everywhere. So, you know, often yeah. things that people think of as weeds like plantain, not the banana, but the one that grows on the ground. It's great for rashes or stings or bites. It's a drawing, drawing plant. So it draws those things out, but it's also edible. I made salmon tacos with it all the time <laughs> to bring some vegetables into my diet when I was up on Vancouver Island for a loan. So by knowing just maybe 10 or 15 plants and maybe mushrooms, you can get by uh, and learn what, you know, have quite a lot of knowledge that you can use really wherever you go. Thanks so much for being here and watching that video. And can I ask you to please subscribe to our channel so you can find out when we're posting new content. You'll be alerted right away when we do to share this with people you think might benefit from the information. And certainly it helps us if you like the video. So if you like what you just saw, go ahead and hit that like button. And again, thank you so much for being here with me right now.